All right, let me put up the diagram that I put up almost every class, and let's talk specifically about ASP.NET and how it's relevant. Um, we've seen, we haven't seen the whole picture yet in our ASP.NET example, but um, we will, um, you know, in subsequent classes. I guess it depends on what you mean by the whole picture. Um, anyhow, we have a client, which is someone surfing the web using some sort of device. And it might not even be a person. I mean, it could be a bot. In other words, the, 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 the crawler that goes and indexes the, the Google search index would be an example of a client because it's making requests. A client is an entity that makes requests that make it through the server, make it through the internet, to the web server, the server does something with that request and responds to it. So key terms, request, and response. The request is going to include a URL, maybe some form data, IP address, which can be used to determine location, or rather approximate location. <coughs> um, the platform that's being used, and so on down the line. Information about the request and who's making the request get transmitted through the internet, sort of in an envelope, in a package. All right? <coughs> the web server thinks about it and responds. The response is going to be in terms that the client understands. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and ancillary files. Now again, we talk about static pages, which aren't terribly interesting. In that case, the pages are simply delivered to the client without really any processing. But we're not really interested in those. We're interested in dynamic pages, and in the ASP.NET framework, Using the web forms approach, again, web forms is one of the approaches that you can use with, with ASP.NET. There's actually two files involved. There is an ASPX file, and there is a .cs file, assuming you're using C Sharp as we are in our class. Now, these files each have their own roles. And we've seen an ASPX file, we've seen an example of that. Today we're going to bring the .cs file into the mix. All right. The ASPX file is an HTML document plus ASP.NET controls. And Syntactically, ASP.NET controls look like HTML tags. In other words, they use the tag notation. They have the, the greater than, less than, greater than signs. They have a tag name. They're differentiated from HTML tags by the use of a namespace. So there's typically ASP in front of them, ASP colon in front of the names of the tags. And they have properties. They have properties that can be set either through the GUI interface or simply by typing in the properties, just like you'd set a property on an HTML tag. Keep in mind, with the addition of these ASP.NET controls, this is basically just an HTML file. So anything you can do in an HTML file, you can do to this. So you can create a CSS file, and so on. These ASP.NET controls, however, give us a number of advantages. And I intentionally picked the calendar last time as my example, because that... Um, it's probably the most dramatic case of how a single ASP.NET control translates into a whole bunch of stuff. All right. Other cases, there's uh, maybe a lot of functionality associated with the control, but the transformation doesn't look as dramatic. It might be more of a one-to-one um, -one correspondence between the ASP.NET control and the HTML that's generated. But remember, the client isn't going to see these ASP.
USB dynamic controls because these are processed by the web server. And by processing, they are translated using the properties and, and everything else into the HTML that's necessary to implement that control. So that's why when we look at a page in Visual Studio, we see an ASP calendar control. When we actually run that page and view it in our web browser, we don't see an ASP. Dot, we don't see an ASP.NET control because browsers don't understand ASP.NET controls. Those controls get translated into the things that browsers do understand: HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Now we mentioned there's all kinds of properties with these HTML controls when we looked, uh, or with these ASP.NET controls. When we looked last time, we looked at the calendar. We could pick, for example, the start of the week. Does the week start on Monday? Does it start on Tuesday? And so on down the line. And we can set those properties in the ASPX page. What we haven't talked about yet is this .cs page that allows us to dynamically change any of the properties that we can set in those ASP.NET controls. If this is all that ASP.NET controls did, it would be kind of cool, all right? But you really would lack the power of ASP.NET. The real power of ASP.NET comes into the fact that we can program now. And we can, based on a number of things, we can manipulate um, those controls and change properties and use the properties from it and do things with those properties. We can, for example, take the results of a form and store it in a database. One thing I mentioned last time that I like to reiterate, because I think it's an important concept, is when you talk about a machine being a server, you always have to talk about within a specific context. In other words, some machines are both clients and servers. And the web server, which is job, whose job is to serve up web pages, might itself be a client to a database server. All right? And therefore, you know, you don't have a machine that is the server. Sometimes people like use that term offhandedly. And really, a server is a server um, when it's in a particular role, when it's functioning in a particular role. It'd be like a server in a restaurant. You know, they're not a server 24-7, you know. If, if you see um, a wait person from your favorite restaurant, you know, out in Target, you can't say, hey, go get me a sandwich, right? Because they're not in the proper context for that. So a machine is a server in a, pro in a certain context. And a web server is, is a server in the context of it's listening for web, uh, requests for web pages and it's responding to them. All right, any questions about this? I would hope this would be largely review, but it's really important to sort of understand where all this stuff comes in, all right? Otherwise, stuff is going to seem confusing to you. The one last bit that we don't really emphasize in this class, we don't write much JavaScript of our own, but remember that what gets sent to the client includes some JavaScript. And that JavaScript itself can be used to make the page a little bit dynamic and interactive. All right, I'm going to create the example from scratch again, like I did, the example I did um, last week. I'm going to create that example again from scratch. Where I create the calendar control, we look at its properties, and then we're going to go beyond it to use the .cs file to actually code stuff for those properties. file, new website. It will ask us a few things about the website. First of all, we want to be using C Sharp. We want to create an empty website. 
All right. Some of these other options we may look at at some point, but to start out, we're going to create an empty website, and we can choose where we want to put it. So I'm going to put it on the desktop in a folder called Tuesday. Do I want to create it? Sure. I click OK. It creates my empty website. Well, it's not really empty, <laughs> all right, because it does include a web config file. Um, the web config file contains parameters about this particular website. And to start <coughs> off, there's not much in this file. Some, some information about what version of the framework we're using and so on. But later on in the semester, we'll put more stuff in here. It is important to note where this is because that is your website's home directory. And that's the directory that you're going to need to send to me. And that's the directory that you're going to need to open if you go and save this website and come back and work on it the next day. So as we'll see here, we actually have two versions of it. We have a debug and a sort of completed version, and they work together. We go out and look in the file system. There's the two files. So I'm going to go and I'm going to create file new, file. I'm going to create a web form. If you don't have it already, by default, it will call it default.aspx. Default.aspx is sort of the default, if you will, name for your home page. So if you're building an app, your home page um, would be uh, default.aspx. Now, if you're only doing one page, like we're doing for some of these assignments, that should be called default ASPX. It'll make it easier for me to grade. All right. Why do you care about that? You probably don't. But if it is easier for me to grade, it, it will probably put me in a better mood, and that can't be a bad thing. All right. There is an option to place code in separate file, and you want to have that checked. We talked about this before. I probably rambled on for 20 minutes about the expense to modify a program and how everything changes and maintainability and all that kind of stuff. Um, by separating stuff into different pieces and the different components, it's sort of the divide and conquer approach. All right? And uh, it leads for more maintainable code than just having one big pile of code all in one place. So we're going to place our code in a separate file. So I click Add, and I get, for that one web form, I get actually two files, the files that we talked about before, the ASPX and ASPXCS. One thing to keep in mind is that renaming a file can be difficult because you have to rename the file, you have to rename the CS, you have to rename some of the things up here. So be careful if you're renaming stuff. As I said before, an ASPX file is simply an HTML file, but an HTML file on which we can put ASP.NET controls. And those ASP.NET controls um, contain some fundamental basic sort of functionality that many, many websites are likely to use. You know, they sort of gave you a head start. They gave you a framework, something to build upon. Now, of course, they can't do all the work for you. You know, your problem, the problem that you're trying to develop a web page for, is unique. You know, no one else has exactly the same requirements as your web page. But there are a lot of elements of your web page that many web pages and web many websites uh, share. And therefore, what these components attempt to do is to take these things that everyone's going to be doing and make them so that they're easy to do. 
So I'm going to start by putting a calendar control on the page. And you can do this so many different ways. I could actually start typing in ASP colon, whoops. Maybe I can't start typing um, in. Yeah, this, that keyboard is very um, temperamental. We used to call it the ghost. Okay. Semester. Okay. It would type on its own, so. Good. Well, I, you know, if I'm having a tough day, maybe I'll let it do its thing. You know, maybe you'll have a better day than me. One time it actually spelled out a word and we were pretty creeped out. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it would depend on what the word was, you know. I forget. It was some, like, simple word, but it actually spelled out, like, the red rum, <laughs> something like that. Um, the other thing we can do is we can drag and drop. And we can drag or drop either in graphical mode, design mode they call it, or just in regular code mode. So that's, that's sort of nice too. All right. So I'm going to drag my calendar over. And there we go. It gives it an ID which all these controls are going to have an ID. Um, and that's going, to, that's going to be what the code uses to refer to them. You could, for example, have a bunch of calendars on your page, you know, potentially. You could have a bunch of text boxes on your page. You'd have a bunch of drop downs on your page. In your code, you're going to need to be able to say which one you want to do something to. So the ID identifies that. All right. We can also add parameters a couple different ways. This way, by simply typing it in. Or this way, by the Properties Browser. The other thing that you will find is that things as far as the appearance of the page, you can control a couple different ways. You can control them through standard CSS. Why? Well, because remember, these ASP.NET calendar controls, as all ASP.NET controls, get translated into HTML. So therefore, if you just as you can write CSS for any HTML, you can write CSS for the HTML that this guy generates. All right? The trick is is you have to understand what HTML gets generated. All right? So for example, a calendar I know generates a table. All right? For example. So I could create a style rule based on a table tag or based on a TR tag or the TD tag. And that style will hold because um, that's what this gets translated into. I can also go in and set some styles this way. I generally use CSS to do the styling where, wherever possible, all right, simply because that's sort of the standard for it, all right. But if you're a little weak on CSS, you know, you could potentially use the styles here. So let me go in and, and show you what I mean. I'm going to create a style sheet. And I'll put in a, a style for a table. Now one potential problem, and I don't know if we'll run into it here or not, is because you can apply styles a couple different ways, it's possible that a style you apply via ASP.NET properties will interfere with the style that the CSS generates. That's one of the reasons I do everything via CSS. That way I don't get that uh, issue. So I go and I put in a style for a table. What? Well, there aren't any tables here. However, I know that the ASP.NET control translates to a table. I actually had a, an argument with a book publisher <coughs> once that wanted me to contribute a chapter to one of the books. And they never used the chapter that I wrote, but I still got paid. So I don't really care what they did with the chapter that I wrote. But I emphasized uh, in my chapter how ASP.NET controls translate to HTML. 
And they were saying, no, you don't need to know. The students don't need to know that it translates into HTML. And it's like, what? How, why would the students not need to know that? That's important when you do things like styling and all sorts of different things. So you need to know what it translates to. So how do you find out if you don't know? You run it and then view the source within the browser, like I'm going to do here. So I'll go and I'll run this guy. Somehow it didn't make it. Oh, duh. Why didn't it make it go all the way across the screen? You didn't save your um, you didn't apply maybe, the but I also didn't apply the CS to that page. Do keep in mind if I ever make a mistake like that, it's because I'm testing you. It's not because I forgot to do it or made a mistake. I had an old teacher in fourth grade that would doze off, like when we were working on stuff, would doze off because she was probably like 150 years old at least, all right? And she would claim that she was testing us. She wanted to make sure that we would behave ourselves even when we thought the teacher was sleeping. And even when I was in the fourth grade, I didn't believe that. All right. I was like, it's like, you know, what was fourth grade? Like nine? You know, I'm like, oh, come on, lady. You know, who are you trying to kid? Okay, so now we'll apply it. And hopefully it will work. And there we go. It goes all the way across the screen. Now, if we look at this, we do a view source. Again, I knew that it translated to a table, so that's how I built the style rule. You can always go and view source of your HTML, which I used to like the way that it did it before, but... And you can see all these different things that it generated, some JavaScript, and here is actually the table that it generated. Now remember in CSS, for those of you that have CISS 216, you can put CSS based on the tag name, so I could say all tables get that. I could use a class, or I could use an ID. So we know what the ID is, calendar one, and there actually is an attribute of the calendar for CSS class. So I could go and I could apply a CSS class. So I could make, you know, maybe certain tables be, you know, go all the way across the screen, have other tables only go halfway across the screen or something like that. All right. So we can set properties of that. We saw that. So I can make the day of the week start at You actually have the ability to alphabetize these attributes or categorize them, which sometimes categorizing them is easier. Like here's all the things related to the behavior. Yeah. 
this is relating to the layout, miscellaneous, appearance, first day of week. So I can go and set that to Monday. All right. So I can set the properties that way, but I can also set the properties via code. And that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to set, I'm going to create a button that would allow you to set the day of the week to either Sunday or Monday, the starting day of the week, because that's typically the, the two things, at least in all, our culture, that we use as starting days of the week. All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to add two buttons to my page. I'm going to do this a very brute force way, and then we'll talk about doing it a better way. All right. First of all, before we do that, let's write some code. Let's write some. Let's, let's get even simpler. Let's write some code to show and hide the calendar. All right. So I want to manip manipulate a bunch of different properties of this. So we'll start by showing and hiding the calendar. And the reason I mention this is showing and hiding is very relevant to your next assignment. So I want to cover an example where we show and hide stuff. The other thing that's relevant that we may or may not talk about today, we'll probably talk about at some point, is the panel control. Um, the panel control sort of allows you to show and hide a bunch of stuff all in one swoop. So in other words, if you have a whole bunch of things, you don't have to hide them individually or show them individually. You can just write code to show or hide the panel that those things lay on. All right, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to graphical mode. And I'm going to put a couple of buttons on my page. I'm going to make this button called show. And I'm going to make this button called Hide. This is the text that displays on the button. Now, the one thing that I should do is give it a meaningful ID. Because button one, button two don't mean anything. All right? Now, when I'm working on this today, I might remember that button one is the Show button, button two is the Hide button. But when I come back to this a month from now, that's something that's going to be confusing to me. Wait a minute, is button one what shows it or what hides it? Or does it change the day of the week to Monday or whatever? You don't want to go there. right? You don't want to worry about that. Even if it just takes you a second to look it up, you want to make it easier to maintain. So give your variables meaningful names. So I'll call this btn show. And I'll call this btn And hide. Now, of course, there's nothing going on here, right? I mean, there's no code. So if I were to run this, I'd simply get my calendar and I'd get my two buttons, but it wouldn't show anything. All right. Now I want to write some code behind it. So I'm going to double click the show button. And we're going to notice a couple things happen. When I double click the show button, I get put in, wish I had a bigger monitor here, I get put in the code behind file, default.aspx.cs. This, remember, is where our C sharp code goes. All right? And this is where we can manipulate any of those properties that we set for any of our ASP.NET controls. All right? So we can manipulate them. <coughs> now, what do I want to do? I want to point to that calendar, and I want to change it from visibility of being visible to not being visible. All right. Now, how do we do that? We do that two ways. This is always a challenge in any sort of object-oriented programming, uh, and it's always be the challenge in ASP.NET. First of all, we have to point to the object that we want to change, right? Because I might have, again, three or four calendars.
calendars on the page. So I can't simply say calendar disappear. All right. How do I point to the specific thing that I want to change? Use the ID. All right. So the ID was calendar one dot, and I will see, again, this is where the old school me cries a little bit because this gives you so much help, all right? It tells you the list of attributes associated with it. What are attributes or characteristics, all right? So when we created this calendar, there's a whole slew of characteristics that we set. Now we can, through our code, change those characteristics, all right? And believe me, we didn't have this back in the day of punch cards where it's when you punched a hole, it told you what the other possibilities were. Now, you had to know them, right? So be grateful that you have this capability. Uh, this really is the reason that I use Visual Studio in a class like this as opposed to advocating a plain text editor because the .NET framework is so rich and has so many things that it would be impossible to memorize all of them. All right, so I can scan through here and look for it. And if I pick an attribute, it will sort of give me an explanation of what that attribute is. All right. CSS class gets or sets the CSS class rendered by the web server on the client. I happen to know is visible. Visible. Gets or sets value indicates whether a server control is rendered at UI on the page. So. I can say visible equals true. All right. So it's an assignment statement. This equals that. So what is this? Well, this is a combination of the specific control that we want to change and the property that we want to change. So we want to change that calendar. What about that calendar do we want to change? We want to change its visibility. We want to change it from visible true to visible false. All right. Now, do keep in mind that, again, each data type, each, each property has uh, a data type associated with that. So I couldn't say, for example, visible equals, yeah, 78. It's going to complain about that because 78 is an integer and you can't convert an integer to a Boolean. A Boolean is simply a variable that can only have one of two values, true or false. Now, that's what it did in the code behind file. Notice what it did. It created, because I clicked on the button, it created a method. It created a function called btn show underscore click. All right, this is a function. Doesn't return anything. This is name. And these are arguments that are automatically going to get passed to that function. Now, right today, we don't have any use for these arguments. But later on in the semester, we will have use for some of those arguments. Just not today. All right, the curly brackets indicate the start and end of the instruction. Oh, I'm sorry, the function. And then here's our function. So that's what, that's what happened in the code behind file. Let's look if it did anything to our source file. It did. It added an on click event button show underscore click. All right. This is important to know because sometimes if you do something goofy, you know, rename something, start a method, then get rid of it, whatever. Sometimes you will have the you will create a method, but it never gets called. And what you want to check is want to make sure that that method, that code that you wrote, is wired to your button. So here is my button. Here's my show button. It's an ASP button. Its ID is button show. And it's wired to that method. It's wired to that function. 
btn show underscore click underscore uh, click. So it should work. When I click that button, it should work. But if this wasn't there, it's not going to work. Now here's a question. It might be a trick question. I don't know. Does this code execute when I click the button? Does the code execute on the client or server? That's a really good guess, all right, but it's the server, all right. These are ASP.NET server controls, so on-click relates to things happening on the server, all right. So when we click this button, it is going to submit the form to the server. All ASP buttons in a web form are submit buttons, so when I click that, uh, that button, it's going to call the server execute that command and then display a new web page. Now I can do the same thing on the other button and I can put in calendar visible, false. So I go and run this guy. It starts out being visible. Why? Because that's, that's what I, that's the default. That's what I put in when I created the control via I'm going to have to stop this. Via the properties for that control. So if I look at that calendar, if I look at the properties, visible is set initially to true. If I change that to false, then it would pull up the page and it would be set to not visible. So I click hide, makes it invisible. I click show, it's visible. Actually, when I click hide, it does more than make it invisible. It ain't there anymore. So if you make something invisible on the server side, all right, it simply doesn't get sent to the client. And why is that good? saves on bandwidth, yeah. All right, so if you click that, then you're getting a smaller page. If you imagine if this wasn't something as, as basic as a, as a calendar, if this was, you know, a, um, you know, something that required a database query or something that was, um, could produce a lot of data or could take a lot of processing time, it will save you that. Okay. Challenge question. How can we make this so that there's only one button? Okay, that's a good, that's, that's one good possibility. All right, uh, I didn't think of that. I was thinking in a different direction, but that, that's good. Um, what we could do is we could um, <coughs> set it so that only one button was um, enabled at a time. Because really, from a user interface perspective, if you have a button that says show, a person could sit there clicking it expecting something else to show. All right? Whereas really, if it's already shown, there's no need to show it. So therefore, have the show button disabled. When you click on the hide button, disable the one, enable the other, and vice versa. So how would we go about doing that? Let's take this approach first. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it is a property. That's another good standard answer. If I ask, like, how do we change this? It's like, yeah, it, it's, there's a property for that. Well, yeah, <laughs> there, there's always going to be a property for it. So that's the absolute right way to look at it. So let's look. How do we want, what do we want the initial page to look like? What do we want enabled initially and disabled initially? Uh, 
disabled, right? So I'll click on the show button and I will say enable false. I do that right. Yeah, enable false. Now, when I click on it, then when I click on the hide button, I'm going to want to do what? Enable the show button. And disable the hide button. I want to do just the opposite when I click. That. So I'll click and run it. All right. It's disabled. I click high. Three verses true. So that's good. How can we make it with just one button? Yes. An if statement. Uh, and how would the if statement work? So we do if it's visible. Okay. Fin it. Visible equals true. Show show the hide button. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting me confused. <laughs> yeah, we could have, we could, if visible, if it's visible, then hide it. If it's not visible, then show it. With the buttons, we could do one of two things. We could show and hide the buttons. So when you click on the show button, it could hide the show button and show the hide button. All right. Or we could, just, uh, we could just have one button that we change the behavior to, to make it a show button some of the time and a hide button the rest of the time. So let's do that. All right. So let's create a button that we're going to call Show hide. I'm going to try that again. Create a button. I'm going to call it button show hide. And it's always going to be visible and it's always going to be enabled. What's going to change is the code when it gets clicked. And what else, Jesse? The text on the button. So what do I want the text on the button to show originally? I want to show hide originally because it's by default the calendar is shown. So I will say hide. Double click this. Now, when the button is clicked, what do I need to do? If We have two cases, right? The calendar is visible or the calendar is not visible. You're all familiar with if statements, right? An if statement allows branching, allows you to do one thing if one condition is true, another thing if a different condition is true. All right. Um, 
we could write this a couple different ways. Can I just say if calendar one visible? Yeah. Yes? No? Yes, sir. Yes. Why can I say that? Because it automatically assumes it's true. Because it's a bullion. Yeah. Well, I heard a couple wrong answers and one correct answer. It, it doesn't matter what the default value is. It doesn't matter. The question is, is syntactically, is this correct? And it is correct because this variable is a Boolean. All right? In an if statement, what appears between the parentheses? A Boolean statement. That is a statement that can be evaluated to either true or false. So maybe, like in other classes, you saw things like if x equals 0. All right? That's a Boolean, right? If x equals equals 0. All right? That's a Boolean. In other words, it's either true or false. You'll look at the value of x. If x indeed does have a value of 0, then the condition is true. Otherwise, it's false. So. Whatever's within the parentheses gets evaluated. And gets evaluated into a Boolean. And in our case, calendar visible already is a Boolean. So it doesn't need to be evaluated. Like the statement if x is greater than 5 needs to be evaluated. It's already a Boolean, so we can simply say if calendar visible. Could I just say if calendar one? No. no. Why not? That's not a Boolean. That's a calendar object. Okay. Excuse me. A calendar object has a whole bunch of properties associated with it. What month it's showing. The style of it. What the starting day of the week is. All those different properties. We can't simply say if it's true. We have to specify the specific property. And in our case, it's the visible property. If it's visible, then I can make the calendar invisible. If it's not visible, then I make it visible. Now, I also want to change the text on the button. How do I do that? Okay. First of all, I need to point to the button, right? Because there's actually three buttons on our page right now. I need to point to this button. And that is button show high. Dot. And we have a whole slew of things. Not like the old days on punch cards, blah, blah, blah. The property is text. And again, what is the text property of a button? It, it gets or sets the text caption displayed on the button control. Equals. We just made it invisible, so we want the button to say show. We just made it. Visible, so we want the button to say hide. So right now it shows hide. We click it, it says show. We go back and forth. Questions over any of this? Keep in mind, I have two sets of buttons here because I wanted to go over two different ways to do it. If you were doing this functionality, you would not want to have two sets of buttons because that would just confuse the user. In fact, I'm going to put in some code so that if you look at this later on, 
you're not confused. changing the starting day of the week. All right. Is someone happy that I'm doing that? <laughs> yeah. All right. I like the enthusiasm. All right. So I could do this a couple different ways and I'm going to do it sort of a clunky way and then I'm going to do it a better way. All right. Um, it's always the case when you're when you're encountered with a new programming task, you know, think in terms of what you've done before, and think of what part that you want to keep, and then what part you want to change. So I'm going to start off by doing this with buttons. So I'm going to have a button to set it to Sunday, a button to set it to Monday. That's kind of clunky, right? Because if I had one to do all seven days of the week, I'd have seven buttons lined up. All right. So we'll figure out a different way to do it, all right? But we're going to start out doing it this way. And it's okay to code in this manner. It's okay to first take a brute force approach and, and get it done and then think about what you can do to improve it, all right? So I'm going to start out by putting in a couple of buttons. And I'm going to call one of them, I just deleted one. I'm going to call one button Sunday. And the other one button Monday. So there's my button Sunday click event. And sure enough, I want to point to the calendar. I want to find the property. First day week, thank you. <coughs> now, is this going to be true or false? Yeah, let me rephrase that question. Will this, is true or false a valid answer here? No. Either one, no, right? Because this is not of data type Boolean. First day of the week, false. Nope, we're not going to have a first day this yep. week. We're just going to jump right into Tuesday, all right? Sometimes that's not a bad strategy, but we can't do that here. Again, this is going to be of a specific data type where only certain values are allowed. And so if I click an equal sign, IntelliSense will show me absolutely nothing. Ah, there we go. And we can pick first day of week to be Sunday. And we can do the same thing here. Except we're going to set that to be <laughs> Monday. All right, 
I probably should change the labels of these. Yeah, button and button. Keep them guessing. You just you you just you just you hit purchase, but like on no product. Yes. Yeah. You you just you you have bought something. It's like Google, you know, like. Yeah. Do you, are you feeling lucky? Right. Yeah, you know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure. That. <laughs> yeah, that would add some variety. Well, they almost have that on those things where you can like order boxes that are set yeah, to your yeah. house. You know, you can order like a clothes box, so and you give. Understand. You give your size, and, and they just send you stuff that they think you're going to like. Or like a candy box I've seen, or a snack box. Uh, yeah, but like, I just bought a new vacuum cleaner. Yeah, right, but yeah, that would be sort of next level, right, right. Well, it's like the games, when you buy something, you don't know, you click that button and it lands on something, that's what you bought. In, in what? In a game. Oh, really? Oh, okay. This would be real life. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you really bought it. All right. Damn it, I just bought that roll. <laughs> right. Okay, let's run this and see if this works. All right. There it shows Sunday. It's back to Monday. So, yay, it works. So, we could add we could add a bunch of different things. All right. However, as a programmer, whenever you see repeated code, that should be like a red flag for you. Like code that is real same, you know, very, very similar. Like if we have seven buttons that all essentially do the same thing, you know, the question should come in your mind, is there a better way to do this? All right. And yeah, there, there, there is. We're going to actually create a drop down to do this. That's going to have the different days of the week. And then we will have one method that will handle all these. And I am going to do this. And I'm telling you in advance, so you know I'm not like my fourth grade teacher that's making something up after the fact. I am going to mess this up so it won't work at first. And then we'll look and we'll see why it doesn't work because why it doesn't work is a good lesson. It's not just, it's not like I'm just going to spell something wrong or something goofy. I'm, I'm actually illustrating a point. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to put a drop down on my page. All right. When I do that, it says unbound. That means it's not connected to a database. That's fine. We're not doing databases yet, so that's okay. All right. So I'm going to go here and click Edit Items. And I'm going to add seven items. Notice each of these items has a text and a value. <laughs> I feel like that's like <laughs> punctuating my, like, like this is a game show and these are the sound effects. That's great. Whoever's doing that, keep doing that the rest of the semester. <laughs> Notice that every item in the list has a text and a value. That isn't quite so important here, but it will become important later on. The text is going to be something that's understandable to the user. The value is going to be something that's understandable to the code. So for example, if we had a search by faculty member here at LC, if the drop down showed a list of all our ID numbers, that wouldn't make any sense, right? That would be like your surprise register in any class, you know, and you wouldn't know who you're getting until they showed up the first day, all right? What people would need would be the need, need to see the name of the person. So Zellers, Hum, um, what, what's the other guy's name? Humphrey, no, Huffman. Um, <laughs> Norod, Harms, uh, um, 
networking guy, Doug Huber, all right, and so on. So people will need to see the name. Now the script behind the scenes might need something else. Like, for example, it would probably need, in database terms, the primary key to the faculty table. So it would need an ID number of some sort. All right? So the value would be what the script needs. The text is going to be what people need. Now, it doesn't really matter in this case quite so much. So I'm going to make... Monday the first one, Tuesday the second one, Wednesday the third one, And actually, honestly, I could have just typed out the names here, but I picked a different value to show simply to illustrate uh, the point. All right. So I'm going to run this, but don't expect anything to happen. I haven't even made my mistake yet. So it's not like I've, had, I've made my mistake yet. All right. But I haven't written any code to change it based on... Uh, based on the, the day of the week got uh, chosen. So I go and run this. I just want to illustrate the HTML that gets generated. So there's a drop down. It shows the things that we have said people will understand. If we view a source, we'll see, what will we see? We'll see our drop-down with the option and the value, values being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, the thing between the option tag being the day of the week. All right, so I'm going to write code to make this work, and I'm going to make a mistake. All right, then we'll talk about two ways that we could fix this mistake. All right. So, I'm going to double click on this. No, I'm not. I'm going to go into here and I'm going to double click on that. <laughs> that brings me into a drop down selected index changed event. All right? Remember when we clicked on buttons, we went into the click event. When we, went, when we double click on drop downs, we go into the index changed event. The index changed event means when the user actually picks a different value. All right? So when you double click on a control, it sort of takes you into the event that it thinks you probably need, which a lot of times is right, right? The typical event that you're going to do. So I'm going to write, and I could do this a bunch of different ways, but I'm going to write a simple series of if statements. If. Drop down list one, dot. And again, there's a whole different, a whole list of choices here. I want the selected value. The selected value is the value of the item that the user has selected. All right? So I'm going to say if that equals one. Now we could clean up this code, but I'm simply going to say, if it's equal to 1, then values Monday. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we could go and change all of these.
And then we go and make all these Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And this will not work, even though it sure looks reasonable. All right? Any guesses on why it didn't work? We're not, um, we're not checking if it changed. Okay, we're not checking if it changed. That is a true statement. Why are we not checking that it changed? Let me ask you this question. Where does the code that checks to see if the value has changed, where does that code live? On the client or the server? Well, where was the code that made it visible and invisible live? Lives on the server. So it's probably a good bet that the code here lives on the server. So in a nutshell, we are not going back to the server. There's nothing about changing a value of a dropdown that inherently sends it back to the server. When you click a submit button, by definition, that's what the submit button does. It sends it to the server. If we simply change the value of the dropdown, it doesn't send it to the server because you can change the value of the dropdown all day. It's only when you submit it to the server that it's going to go and do it. Watch this. I changed the first day of the week to Monday. I hide it. I show it again, and bang, the first day of the week is Friday. So as soon as it hits the server, it notices that it changed, and it goes and makes that change. So we have to make it so that when, we have to make it so that when they change this, it goes back to the server. How could we do that? Well, there's a, there's a straight up forward way. We could put a little, little button here that says, go and make the change. And all that, we wouldn't even have to put any code on that button. All we need to do is send it to the server. The other thing that we could do is we can set the property on this guy to be auto postback. Auto postback simply means when you change the value in the dropdown, send it to the server. All right? And again, it entirely depends on the situation you're working if this is what you want to do or not. For example, if you had a big old form and you had a drop down for state, and someone was entering in all their personal information, name, address, city, state, zip, phone number, email address, social security number, birth certificate number, blah, 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 you wouldn't want to have that as an auto submit, where as soon as they picked their state, boom, it went and tried to save it. But in this case, as soon as we change the Starting day of the week, we might as well go to the server and change it. So I'm going to set auto post back to true, and then this should work. So if I go and change it to Sunday, or let's change it to Thursday, watch real carefully as I make this change. You'll notice some activity which indicates maybe the status bar will change. Maybe this will change up here. You'll notice maybe the page will just flicker for a second. But you'll notice that it has been sent to the server and the page has been regenerated. All right. So let me click this to change it to Thursday. 
and there we go. Because it made it back to the server so it could check it. Now, notice I, if I pick Thursday and don't change it, it doesn't do that. Why? Because it didn't change it, so there's no need to send it to the server. Notice something else, and this is an important thing, and this is going to be my cliffhanger for today. We'll talk about it a little bit, and then we'll talk more about it next time. Notice that when I go and change the day of the week, it sends it to the server, displays a calendar with the new starting day of the week, but it keeps a drop down in the same place, which is a good thing, right? So if I change it to Tuesday, it's going to send it to the server, it's going to redisplay the calendar, and my drop down stays on Tuesday. That's actually a great thing. That is called maintaining state. All right? Believe it or not, that's not something that in other web platforms you could depend on. Because state is a big issue in web development. And ASP.NET maintains your state. In other words, it remembers what happened before. And uh, being able to do that takes a lot of burden off you as a developer. We'll continue to explore that thought next time. All right, any questions about this example? Well, just, well, let's make sure we understand what clicking that button does. We still had to write the script, right? We still had to write the function that did it. The only thing that we didn't need to do is put a button here to submit it. Because if I put <coughs> auto post back, that automatically, whenever I change my selection, sends it back to the server to be processed. So I still coded everything. It's just a matter of how I'm going to start that code executing. All right, I will go and open up lab and then I will